You're listening to the What's Happening Podcast with Gary Watts. Good morning. I'm here with Charlie Becker from Camp Courageous. And if you've never been to Camp Courageous, you should go. It's in Monticello, Iowa. So welcome, Charlie. How are you? Good I'm to doing, see you. I'm doing wonderful, Gary, and I really appreciate this opportunity. This is going to be fun. I've, I'm so excited to have you here because if people do not know about Camp Courageous, they're missing something. So let's start out. Tell us, uh, before we get into Camp Courageous, tell me a little bit about yourself, you know, where you come from, you know, where you went to school, whatever you want to tell us about. Sure. And then how you got, one of the things I like to do with all my guests is how did you get interested in what you're doing? And I know you've been to with Camp Courageous, what, 44 years or so. Yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit about yourself for the listeners. I appreciate that opportunity. Uh, I grew up in Dubuque. Grew up in what I would consider somewhat of a dysfunctional family. And so uh, my family, we moved about every 18 months. And uh, Military I, or what, what? No, just uh, we rented and we were fairly, I wouldn't say poor, poor, lower middle class. Transient. So, yeah, transient. Transient. And so, uh, you know, you learn a lot of things uh, by growing up in a situation like that. You either, it either becomes your excuse or it's your reason to uh, excel. And I found I could excel through a work ethic that was uh, pretty good. So went to Dubuque and uh, always had jobs. Always had two jobs since I was 14. Then went uh, down here to uh, Iowa City. What would you do with your jobs? Uh, what kind of jobs? Or? Yeah, we were 14. So 14, before 14, I was babysitting, uh, shoveling sidewalks, and cutting grass. And then once I hit right. 14, my first job was uh, washing dishes in a nursing home. Then I went on to uh, Spina Rose to a lumber yard and yeah. then went on into uh, banking and uh, to be bank and trust. And they treated me extremely well. I worked at one time as a high school student. I was uh, vice president of our coin department, which you wrote coin. And that was a self title that we gave ourselves. That huh. wasn't really something the bank knew about. And then later on during college, I could be a teller for eight hours during the day. And I did custodial work for another eight hours. So they allowed me to do 16-hour days, and get time and a half for those other eight hours. So they treated me very well. You mentioned teller. I love tellers. I still <laughs> go into the bank. I'm one of the only ones. Uh -huh. I think there's like 10% of bank service now with people actually go into the lobby. Sure. <laughs> I yes. always like to say, hey, how are you doing? You know, and maybe get some cash or whatever. But everything's done by emails, remote, or a card or, or chat rooms, and I like tellers. So I just so to, you know that. I used to always enjoy, I'd, I'd <laughs> have the dog ones. Once in a while, i do drive through and you'd have the dog bones for the dogs, yeah, and you'd have a little yeah. candy for everybody else. So yeah. it was a fun job. I've always enjoyed work. I, I've really right. always received a lot of enjoyment. Where'd you get your work right. ethic? Your folks, your dad, your mom? Um, you know, I, I think in a way we didn't really have a choice. And so, hmm. like, if you wanted a bicycle, if you wanted right. anything, and, and I look back and – because nobody ever believes it, but my mom, my dad died when I was 14 of cancer. Mm. And so my mom would charge us rent. So as soon as we got that first paycheck at 14, 15 bucks a week. And so, you know, paid wow. rent. And so you didn't have a choice and you worked. And, uh, How many siblings? I have an older brother and a younger brother. My younger brother died of cancer also. So mm. we've got a little, little history there that we watch pretty close. Yeah. So. Well, that's amazing. So I'm sure that work ethic has been something that's been with you your whole life, right? It really Experience. was. Like, then I came down to Iowa City, was uh, down here for three years, got in and got out just because of uh, money. And I got out, you know, at an even point. I didn't owe anybody any money. And then... Uh, U of I or you just came here to work? University of Iowa to, uh, school. to go to school. And then I worked at uh, Veterans Hospital. I used to transport. This is back when there were still World War, World War I veterans and wow. World War II veterans. And we would transport them to and from the hospital. So I would get, I learned all these wonderful stories. And later on, I taught history. So, I mean, I got the stories right from the individuals that were in those environments. So fascinating work, always appreciate it. And then a lot of odds and ends job. There's a Mr. Moffat down here that anytime when somebody needed their yard raked or anything, they'd phone me up. And then I uh, took care of a lady that had a stroke by the name of Mrs. Crum. And she used to work down at, uh, her and her husband worked at a a place called Whetstones downtown to make mm -hmm. lots and everything years ago. Yeah. And then uh, ended up out of Beckman Butheris uh, Funeral Home. They had the contract with uh, the VA hospital to provide transportation to and from the hospital. So you know, speaking of, you mentioned the veterans. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's not too many World War II veterans around left. Right. It's amazing. <laughs> I don't know how many die a day, but I'm sure it's, you know, but there, we're almost at the end of it because 1945 was the last year of that. 
and that puts them right close to 100 or 98, even if they were just young kids. And I've always said it'd be nice that everybody, every kid today or every student, university, high school, should spend about an hour or two listening to a World War II veteran that was actually in combat, either the Pacific theater or European theater, of how much, what they did to sacrifice for the country. There, I can't say enough about what veterans did for us. And I think a lot of today, kind of what I sense is they, they don't even know what happened. They don't know about the conflicts that we fought in two theaters. And it, I think it would be really important for people to have that uh, exposure, but there's not many left. No, I, I taught uh, government for three years, and uh, part of my teaching was bringing the World War II individual, the Vietnam, Korea, all those people in to talk about their experience. You can learn in a book, but wow, there's nothing yeah. more impressive than than sitting there talking to the person that has right. personally experienced it. Yeah. So, yeah, big, and, huge advocate. And a lot of them, you now they'd want to talk about it, but if you could get some of them to talk about it, it'd be amazing. So, so anyway, so you're at Iowa City, and then where'd you go? So I did a fellowship over in Exeter, England for a semester, then came huh. back to teach, and I was working at the bank, got a phone call, and uh, superintendent school, and they said, yeah, we're interested in talking to you about a, a teaching job. I'm, oh, I'm on cloud nine. I'm ready to go. And I, you know, they said, can you come down and, and interview? No problems. And he goes, uh, do you know where we're at? I said, if you're on the map, I can find you. And uh, it's back when they had maps. And uh, <laughs> used a map, too. Yeah. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, we're not on the map. I'm going, oh, no. Oh, <laughs> what am I getting myself into? <laughs> and it was uh, Central Lee down mm. southeast Iowa. Argyle. Ar- very, wow. I've, I've done the audit there. I'm impressed. Yeah. Fort Madison. Ki- sure. Yeah. Yes. I know exactly where you're at. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I went down there for the interview, <laughs> and I, I got the job. It was my first you know, a salary position, and I love teaching. Absolutely love teaching. If there was a teaching job, so I got married and I had kind of an agreement. My wife doesn't remember this, but we weren't going to live there and we weren't going to live in Dubuque. We'll be someplace in between. And I'd still be teaching if there would have been a job open, but uh, there wasn't. So uh, the old domain register and people read newspapers and the want ads. And uh, I wanted to get up in the northeast Iowa. If Iowa City had a teaching job, I'd be there in a second. And uh, nothing was there. And so there is a job at... uh, Camp Courageous, hmm. and I had done volunteer work down at uh, Camp Sunnyside in Des Moines, and uh, I thought, yeah, you know, this is kind of like the Peace Corps. Let's let's try this out for a couple years and if uh, see what happens, and then I'll just get back into teaching. And uh, a couple years turned into forty four, so wow. who knows? Wow. Yeah, you just and, and I think that's really important with uh, with people in general is that it's it's good to have goals, it's good to have all those things, but once in a while, just letting nature take its course and live life as it is and would i have ever dreamed i'd be doing what i'm doing you know not in my wildest dream right. and uh but wow i love it great so now you're camp courageous so let's talk about uh what your 44 years have looked like and let's talk about anything you want to talk about camp courageous volunteering you know what's the mission uh, how that's grown just Let's just let's dive into Camp Courageous because, like I've told you before, uh, if people if you do not know what Camp Courageous is, you need to experience Camp Courageous. First of all, it's a beautiful area, and what you do for campers, and uh, all the improvements you've made over the last five to ten years, and all the fun things that go on up there, and helping kids. And one thing I found: if you're giving, and you're caring about somebody, you can't be in a bad mood. No. Oh. How, how can you be upset if you're at Camp Courageous? It's such a neat thing. It's such a joyous thing to see the little train go around and all the fun things. The zip line now come up. That was you know we were up there this this fall doing some stuff and I, I was on the zip line. I tell you that was that was like <laughs> okay you know that was like oh, I better hang on here because it, it definitely gives you a zip. Yeah. But, but let's talk about whatever. Let's get into Camp Courageous. Let's talk about. Whatever you want to talk about with Camp Courageous. Let's start off from a personal standpoint is after that many years, I still can't wait to get to work in the morning. I, I this is a morning cool. like this morning. I was there a little after four in the morning. I like to be the first one there and just kind of get uh, get everything going while it's still kind of quiet. And so and that type of enthusiasm is pretty much camp wide. You know, people are just they're they're in early, they work late. So just a real dedicated group of people. But 
The camp started back in 1972 when 40 acres of land was donated for the sole purpose of establishing a camp for the uh, individuals with disabilities. That 40 acres was landlocked, and so there was farmers on one side, on the other side was state property. So, and it was rugged land, and there's no way that it could uh, ever be used as a camp. So they went down and they talked to the state of Iowa Conservation Commission at that time about trading that 40 acres, that original 40 acres were where we are right now. And that got uh, taken care of, and so we were off and running. What did you trade for again? Uh, we yeah. had original 40 acres that was donated. Donated. You had a yep. piece that was donated. Yep. It was up the river. It was landlocked. And then we traded with the state of Iowa for where we are right now on a, on, a, on a road. And so we could actually get to it. It was level. You could build on it and things like that. And actually, there was a uh, the Pichirox United Methodist camp was right across the road. So it was a campy area. So on past the camp, you go down to Picture Rocks. What what stream is that? Or what river? Maquoketa River. Maquoketa River is down there. Okay. So we're surrounded by thousands of acres of state primitive land. I didn't and know that. Oh, they're great neighbors. Great yeah, neighbors. Perfect so, neighbors. Perfect they, neighbors. They leave you alone. Yes. <laughs> Caves, climbing, repelling bluffs, uh, the Maquoketa River for fishing and canoeing and kayaking and things like hmm. that. Just so our to our east is all state primitive land. So as you mentioned, it is a gorgeous hmm. place to have a camp. So in 1973, then, they build the first five buildings, and Tate and Dottie Cummins from uh, WMT and uh, yeah. all, Iowa Hawkeyes and everything right. got involved. They have a son, Charlie, who has a disability. Charlie is uh, 63 years old now, oh. and both Tate and Dottie are, are past. And so they got involved started getting the word out, and at that time, the camp was called Camp Courage. And so <laughs> WMT decides to have the world's largest garage sale at Hawkeye Downs for Camp Courage. And there's a Camp Courage up in Minnesota, unbeknownst to us. And uh, they heard about the garage sale down in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And they said, isn't that wonderful? Cedar Rapids, Iowa is doing a benefit for Camp Courage. And then they realized, oh, (laughs) wrong place. And so uh, that Camp Courage is part of Dayton Hudson and uh, Target stores. And so they have attorneys. We had an attorney. And they contacted us and said, you know, it would be a good idea to change your name. And so we changed our name. And, and then uh, What year? Change your name. About 1974. Started switching to Camp okay. Courageous. And so uh, first campers came in the summer of 1974. It was 211 of them. Summertime program. A staff of 12. Um, when you say camper, let's talk about that. Sure. What's a camper? So a camper is a person with a disability. What so type of disability? It started out that we would take anybody. So when I started coming to Camp Courageous, we would take anybody just because we were building a program. Right. Uh, today, we homogeneously group the campers. So say, for example, you have a brain injury. There's a week for brain injury. You have a visual impairment. There's a week for a visual impairment. You have muscular dystrophy. There's a week. So you can come to Camp Courageous, and you can fit perfectly into this autistic group, this Down syndrome group, or whatever. But then we also have some open weeks. we got respite care weekends and things like that. So there's a lot of flexibility and any time a family has an emergency, any hour of any day, we're available for emergency respite care. An example, uh, a little camper by the name of Sarah Williams was from over in Chipton, Iowa. Uh, Sarah was on the, uh, she was in a wheelchair, two feedings, uh, probably about two or three years old. And on the family farm, a tree fell on top of her dad. He was rushed to University of Iowa hospitals. Mindy, mom, what are we going to do with Sarah? You know, I got to get with my husband. So Mindy phones up Camp Courageous. We go down and we pick Sarah up. We bring Sarah up to Camp Courageous till her dad gets out of the hospital. So our big situation is that if your back is ever against the wall, we'll be there for you. Hmm. 24-7, 365, we have the medical staff, the dietary staff, the counselors, everybody that could take care of any type of emergency situation. So great programming and great for parents to know that. Just phone us up and we'll help you through. I never knew that. Yeah. Because the lady, the girl you're talking about didn't have a disability. She just needed help. The family yeah. needed help. The family needed help. That's, yep. a, that's nice to know. I yeah. wasn't aware of that. And, and the little girl was in a situation where she was in a wheelchair and had two feedings, and then the medications had to go in with the two feedings. So you just can't go to a neighbor and say, right. hey, neighbor, here's the two feedings. Here's how you do a two feeding. Here's how you mix the medication. But it's reassuring that you, you have staff. And one of the beauties of Courageous, too, is, is – it's a staff that has had a lot of continuity. 
Uh, our program director that just retired was there 40 years. Our nurse was there 30-some years. We just have a lot of continuity. So it's tough as a parent to let go because nobody knows how to take care of their child like they do, and we realize that. And a lot of our – some of our staff have children that have disabilities and things like that. They have backgrounds. They have brothers and sisters that have disabilities. And so it's tough to let go, but it's reassuring – for the parents to know there's such a huge history at Camp Courageous. It's just not a summer camp anymore. We hire year-round counselors, and we have year-round volunteers that are counselors and and uh, year-round people that have experienced just about everything. So you can rest assured that you're going into an environment where they're real familiar with the situation. Can you go back over the special needs of the, of the campers, what categories they are again? So what? the there's, let's, there's <clears throat> two categories that we don't do, and those two categories – is the person with a disability has to be medically stable. We're not a hospital. Right. So you have to be medically stable, and then you can't be a danger to yourself or to somebody else. So those are the, are the only two characteristics that, uh, that a, a person might not be able to come to camp. Otherwise, any type of disability, visually, mentally, physically. And we're just starting, you know, we we're talking about veterans. <laughs> so... I, mean, I get kind of excited about new plans. Yeah. So we got something new every year. We got a new program, something new going on because we want the camper that's been coming out the camp for 50 years to have something new. So Courageous has been like most camps. And it's kind of cool when you're a little kid and you go to Y camp or something right. and you're in this room or in this cabin with a bunch of other people. And that's all neat. And that's how our cabins are set up. Our cabins are set up. We have four rooms in each cabin. We got a group of eight, 12 kids a lot of times uh, in the past in the room and uh, and they have a great time they tell stories all night great time and that's cool we're going to continue that but here in the next year we're going to be looking at building a new camper cabin because say for example somebody like you and me we have a stroke we come out to camp for stroke week or weekend we don't want to be in a room with eight or twelve other people we want our own room and if that ends up being a motel or something like that, that's what it is but there's, we're going to build this camper cabin. It'll have about 40 individual rooms where I, as an individual, I got a brain injury. I got my own room. I got my own. There's two beds in that room. There's a shower. There's a bathroom. And then there's a big meeting area. So say, for example, like muscular dystrophy week. We have Dr. Matthews from down here at the University of Iowa who specializes in muscular dystrophy. So what's really cool about, we'll zero in on that for a moment. What's really cool, during the COVID, it was tough because we are strong believers as teachers and everything. It's great that life is mainstreamed anymore. People with disabilities are right into the mainstream of their school system. That's great. It's good for everybody to realize we're all, all as one. But it's also good, in my opinion, that there's places like Camp Courageous. So muscular dystrophy week, say, for example, you come from Monticello, you come from Cascade. There's like maybe one young person who has muscular dystrophy in the whole city. You come to Camp Courageous, and there's uh, like 100 other people with muscular dystrophy. So as much as the zip line, all these activities are great, you also have the opportunity to establish lifetime friendships with something that you have a, a understanding of that nobody else will have an understanding of. And so during like muscular dystrophy week, the fire department will come on. They'll shoot water up in the air. There's all kinds of activities going up. Great week. But then we also have, like, Dr. Matthews comes up, spends an evening with the campers. So she specializes in muscular dystrophy with the University of Iowa Children's Hospital. And so there's that, that sharing of experiences that nobody else will have. And you got a doctor there that, that is the doctor for almost all these young people. So, so. so, so if a kid has M, called MD, right? Yes. Uh -huh. And they come and they're around 100 other kids like that. Doesn't that help them know that there's other kids with that disability so they can kind of relate to it? Exactly. What's the interaction? Because you're right, if all the other kids are healthy in, in school or in a small school, and then they can interact with those other kids that have that affliction, what? It's, how does that help their soul? I mean, to me, it's got to be amazing, isn't it? Yes, it really is. We just had a camper, and I went up to his funeral uh, from, uh, from way over in western Iowa, uh, Danny, and... Uh, he would travel over, and he, he, his family talked about his first time over, and uh, Danny died. He was in his late 20s, and uh, how scary it was and everything. But lifetime friendships, 
mm-hmm. lifetime friendships that nobody else understands what uh, what they go through. Yeah, it's so another advantage of Camp Courageous. Just it really is. It you really bring is. kids in with the same, uh, whatever you want to call it. Same type of disability. Disease, disability, so, yeah. So it used to be wide open, and then as the numbers grew, then we started going into homogeneously grouping. So a typical year in the uh, summertime is like summer camp. It's a week long. The campers come on yeah. Sunday, leave on Friday. Okay. And we have respite care weekends about twice a month. And so that's a time in which a parent can come, and they can leave off their family member with a disability on Friday night, come back on Sunday, and pick them up. So a lot hmm. of times, you know, you might have a wedding, a funeral, uh, some type of celebration, and it's just not going to work out perfect for the person with a disability to be there. Or sometimes you just need a break. And I right. think uh, any parent in general usually gets to that point where they need a break. <laughs> and so it's just nice that they can bring their child out, leave them off, and, and come back on Sunday and pick and them the up. And the reason they bring them there is because they may be being fed through a tube or there's some kind of a medical prescription or that they need they need a little extra care, right? That's exactly accurate. Uh, a lot of our – anymore, and that's, you know, when we, when we talk about changes from 44 years ago, a lot of medications anymore, lots and lots of medications. And there's some campers that are on just a ton of medications, and we have a full medical staff. And they're kept very busy just with the medications and the basic uh, first aid and things like that. And another change is dietary. And and I think one time we talked about dietary just from the standpoint of, of doing exercises and, right. and running and swimming and biking. But I think there's a lot of special diets anymore. So it's a lot more complexity to the individual. And uh, then there's just a lot of different special needs, like, you know, a camper might be a runner or, or something like that. So... Very individualized. So if it, if you're out there listening to this, what's it cost a camper to come to Camp, camp Courageous? So when I first came to Camp Courageous, we were uh, doing everything for free. And uh, my job was to check in the campers on Sunday. And we found that uh, we might have 50 campers signed up and maybe 30 show up because there's no obligation. So then we got to the point that, okay, what do people get paid for babysitting? So we started out like, uh, let's say 50 cents an hour. So nobody's turned away because of financial difficulties. But we had a doctor from Cedar Rapids phone me up and said, ja- Charlie, I'd love to send my child to camp, but he goes, I'm a doctor. I don't take charity. He goes, you know, give me a, give me a number. And so we came up with a number. So we started out at like 50 cents an hour and then went to a dollar. Now it's $6 an hour. And I'd say the vast majority, vast majority of the campers do not pay $6 an hour. And, and we don't have the staffing to say, you know, we're not interested in anybody's finances. If you say, we, we always like to have something, 10 bucks, 5 bucks, $20, just because it kind of shows a commitment that you're going to show up because we got all this medical staff, all this food and everything else. And so some type of a, of a commitment. And then, uh, then after that, like I said, you know, the majority of the campers you know, might pay a, a part of that or, or some small amount or things like that. So, so money, dur- money never stands in the way of coming to camp. That's, that's great. So during the summer, how many a day, how many a week? So our maximum capacity before COVID was close to 100. So we'd have about 100 staff, about 100 campers. And uh, since COVID, we were knocked down to probably about 75%. So we're, we're, we're regaining. And uh, our, our biggest challenge right now is staffing, is that uh, we uh, offer the nicest facilities. So unlike when I went to camp, you know, the counselor just was right in there with you in the cabin and everything. In our facility, the counselors will come in, put everybody to bed, There'll be like two counselors on cabin duty, so they'll stay there all night in the cabin, and the rest will be over in their dormitory. Our dormitory is like uh, a motel where they have a bed, a bathroom, a shower, and everything in the room. It's like a dormitory, and so it's it's just more conducive to recruiting staff. And so lots of volunteers, but when it comes to paid individuals, uh, we pay the best in the state of Iowa. We expect the best. We expect a lot out of our staff. There's times when you might not sleep for a long time because you got a camper that just can't sleep, and you're going to be up with them. And in return, we try to treat them really good. Our objective is treat them good so they stay with us for a long time. So we have the counselor that's been with us years and years and years just because they love camp. Where do you find the staff? All over. Uh, we used to do a lot of uh, international – We a lot of – all over the, the country, a lot of them from – the state of Iowa, you and I, Iowa State, Iowa, 
and then a wide variety of college is, is a lot of counselors. Uh, we, we've gotten over the years into international programs, so we get some from uh, international. Where Toby came from. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Germany, right? Yes, I, Germany. I, I, so the little story, I love stories. So, <laughs> so th- this shouldn't make any difference, but my office, because I've been there a long time, it's kind of situated where I want it to be. And so I'm, you know, it's, it's, I can see what's going on at the front gate when people come in. And I can also see the campers down here having great activities and everything. So this Mercedes Benz comes in. Not that a Mercedes Benz makes any difference on anything. But I, I'm thinking to myself, this, uh, maybe I should go out and introduce myself to this person. So this person comes in, and I go out and shake hands and everything and say, I'm Charlie Becker. Is there anything I can help you with? And he says, I'm here to volunteer. I go, oh, okay, great. And it's, it's, it's Toby. And he had an uncle down in Atlanta, Georgia, that was in the uh, Mercedes-Benz car dealership business and said, hey, you come over here to the United States and volunteer, and I'll give you a car to use. Of course, Toby was the most popular volunteer counselor that oh, yeah. time period because everybody wanted to ride in his car. And so Toby goes on, and he ends up marrying one of our counselors, which we've had around 60 or 70 counselors that meet at Camp Courageous. Not that we're a dating site. But they meet at Camp Courageous, and I think it's just so much dedication, so much morning, noon, and night. And uh, he met his future wife there, and uh, he's now in charge of our volunteers. But full circle. Toby's a wonderful person. Just yeah. a, he's, I, a, he's a blast. Yeah, he's just yeah. a riot. So, And that's the beauty of Courageous is we got some just really dedicated, good, caring people. So the, most of the staff are uh, students in colleges, and they're, they want to be counselors or teachers or therapists, or is that kind of what they're – Exactly. So a lot of our, so we have a year round staff, like right now of around 35 people. And then once we get into summer, we'll just really be boosting up the counselors a lot more. So we have year round counselors, but then in the summertime, a lot more, a lot of uh, people going into special education, recreational therapy, but some have brothers and sisters that have a disability. So it's just a a wide range of of backgrounds. So, you know, Charlie Becker's political science from the University of Iowa. What am I doing at camp for people? Yeah, this? Yeah. <laughs> so, so you have uh, 100 a hundred a week. That's during the summer. Mm-hmm. So you're going really hard all summer, right? Is Correct. that like June to August or May yeah, that's, to August? Or? That's that's about it. Uh, the uh, end of May, beginning of June, through about the middle of August. Kind of like you normally think of any camp. Yeah, exactly. There. And it's it's kind of keyed in with uh, the universities and colleges as far as when right. they have that little break there, too. What do you do in the off season? Like so September. in the fall time, it's so summertime is almost all kids because that's their summer break. So right. It's almost all kids. Fall time, we get into the older campers, group homes, senior homes, things like that. All older campers. We had we've had the camper that's 100 years old, 105 years old. That's uh, been out during the fall time. And then once we get closer to the holidays, then we have tons of holiday parties out there. Santa comes, and Santa comes out and gives tons of gifts and tons of candy and treats. And Santa read, they had a contest as far as uh, all the campers put their name into a, a box, and whoever Santa pulled out had had the opportunity to ride the zip line with Santa this year. So we have great Santas, and uh, and so that's that's the fall time. Then once we go to the winter time. Uh, Sometimes school groups, sometimes older campers. Then this time of the year, it's all school groups. And so uh, uh, the vast majority of the schools from throughout maybe um, a 100-mile radius, maybe more than that, you know, come out to Camp Courageous. What do they do when they come out? Uh, usually they come up with a bus. So we, we start out with day trips. And so the bus will come in in the morning, and we'll get them right away into activities. And they'll sort out and decide what activities they want ahead of time. So they might do the zip line and bowling and archery. Here's an interesting story. So we had a couple of staff. One of the beauties of Courageous is you could be a counselor there and come up with an idea, and that idea can turn into reality, like a bowling alley. I think we're the only yeah. camp that have a bowling alley in the country. Yeah. Some counselor had that idea. Hey, Special Olympics does it. You know, why, why doesn't Camp Courageous? So we had a couple of staff that came to me and said, uh, you know, Charlie, what do you think about laser tag? I said, eh, doesn't sound like a really good idea to me. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of a hot button now for some folks. And I said, I'll make you a deal, though. And it's not only laser tag. This laser tag had a $25,000 price tag on it. That's a lot of money. When Camp Courageous average donation is $5, 10 15 $20, and it's run on donations, that's a lot of money. So it ends up that uh, I'll make you a deal. 
I said, we'll put it out on our needs list. And uh, if anybody comes through and says, hey, you know, we'll do this, hey, that's great. And I'm thinking to myself, nobody's ever going to say they want to do this. And so, and then make it, give it one step a little bit more complicated. So this is like two years ago. So the best laser tag system in the world was made in Ukraine. Wow. Just a little bit more complicated. And then it's got to come through New York. So there's all these red flags in Charlie Becker's head. All these red flags. So then our friends, uh, John and, and Mary Gilmore, from down here in the Coralville area, mm -hmm. contacted me and said, Charlie, we're interested in donating around $25,000 to Camp Courageous. What would the staff want? I said, well, mm -hmm. I said, we could use a golf cart to do, you know, transport campers and everybody around, but I said, the staff right now are really into this laser tag. And okay, if that's what the staff wants, that's what we want to do. So the next thing, we're, we have a laser tag system out at the camp, and there's we got targets, and you know the campers love it. Wow. But that's kind of how things happen out of Camp Courageous. It's just what they want. Our train, which you mentioned, Tom Riley, attorney yeah, up in yeah. Cedar Rapids. Tom phones me up and goes, hey, Charlie, you're familiar with the train I got. Kids are all too big. We're interested in donating to Camp Courageous. I said, great, wonderful. I'll get a bunch of volunteers together. We'll go over to your house. We'll start pulling up the rail ties and everything and bring it over. And he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. He goes, I said, the train. He goes, I got a trolley. I'm going to continue to use the track. So and I should have initially said this. Charlie Becker has no brains, no vision. Things just happen the way they're supposed to happen. So I go, so we get the train over to camp. Within a couple of days, I get a phone call. A lady over in Ankeny, Iowa. She goes, you don't know me. But my parents know you from the petroleum markers that support the camp. And uh, I am the manager now of the Home Depot over here in Ankeny. If you ever need anything, let us know. Funny you should call. I need 3,000 4 by 4s 32 inches long. She goes, are you kidding? I said, no, I'm serious. I said, she goes, what are you going to do with it? I said, we're building a train track. And so they donated all the wood. Tyson's, Jim Tyson, donated all the bolts and everything that we needed. We just needed the rail. We had volunteers come as far away as Washington, D.C. to come out and help us build that train track. And that's just the way it happens. It's the caboose. So this, yeah. gentleman, by the name caboose? Of, yeah, this gentleman by the name of Lynn Kobliska, <laughs> he's from Waterloo. He's with the Justice Department with the marshals out in Washington, D.C. I get these phone calls. I shouldn't say this. I get these phone calls in the morning from U.S. government. I'm going, okay, must be Lynn. And uh, Lynn took all of his weeks of vacation flew out to Camp Courageous and worked on the train track, just as far as dedication. He always wanted a caboose. At the age of 50, he phoned me up. He goes, I'm not feeling real good, Charlie. He goes, you know, it's probably gonna, I'm just going to take a couple days off and go to the hospital and get checked out. He died of the flu at the age of 50. So we wanted to see his dream because he had all these cabooses all over the country. And uh, so then Jerry Rohr, our, our train engineer, retired individual, he was going through searching the Internet, the Cranic, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City line, they got a caboose. It's like 18 grand. And uh, Larry Greek and a bunch of us went over and, and uh, visit with them. And uh, so that, hey, we're kind of looking for a, a caboose. And uh, they told us the price. And I said, you know, how flexible are you with their price? And they said, well, Charlie, we figured you'd probably be asking that. And we'll give it to you. And by the way, why don't you contact ADM? Here's your number. See if they'll paint it for you. Phone up ADM, bring it down the tracks, we'll paint it for you. And we got a hold of Coonrod. Coonrod brought it to the camp. And who knows small areas better than an RV dealership? Got a hold of Kettleson's. <laughs> hey, we got this caboose. What's your thoughts? We'd like to make it two bedrooms, a bath, a little kitchenette. Hey, we'd love to take it on. Air conditioning. So we have volunteers come and they stay, uh, stay. You know, there. And it's just really worked out, uh, worked out to be a huge hit. Something you mentioned earlier, and I want to go back to you. You mentioned veterans and get excited about veterans. Is that staying in a new dorm? Veterans are welcome to come out? Exactly. Yeah, tell me more about veterans. Okay, so we want to get more and more involved uh, with, with the veterans in general and having the VA background. You know, I, I think that uh, there's, there's those possibilities. And also, uh, Matt Bullwitt, our IT, his brother, you know, flew the big planes, C, whatever they are. C-17. Yes, yeah. into uh, Kuwait, Iraq, and all right. those areas where we've had uh, situations and uh, he's 
he's working with us and we're trying to get a variety of veterans groups with mental or physical disabilities mm. and get them to experience camp. In my opinion, I'm a little bit prejudiced, but I, in my opinion, there's no better environment than you're like at a camp and you're there for a weekend and you, you'll not get to know these people better than that environment. I mean, you can go to a seminar, you're in there for two hours and you come out, you never see those people again. But when you're in an environment, when you're close together, you're, you're eating your meals with these folks, you're visiting with them, you can't beat that. My first program that I ever gave at Camp Courageous was 1980. It was down in Newton, Iowa, VFW convention. Between 1,000 and 1,200 people in the audience. Lay my cards on the table anymore. It's like I spent every minute before I had to go on stage in the bathroom. I was, <laughs> it was not good. Yeah, public not speaking good. is not everybody's no, no, first thing. Especially right? with that many people. And the governor is there and everything else. And so, Governor Ray. Yes, very yeah, good. Yeah. Very good. And so we have had a relationship with the veterans. So veterans help start the camp. They mm. help start build the first buildings and everything else. And so uh, VFW, American Legion, we've been very, very close with them for, for decades. And so we want to make sure that we're giving back whatever we can give back. That, that's such a neat story because, you know, uh, I'm glad that you're doing things for veterans. Sometimes they're forgotten yeah. what they do and they come back. And, and a lot of those guys are hurt mentally and physically. And, uh, you know, they, you know they, we just don't think enough about them. I got one quick story about a veteran that, that I saw on a – I don't know what I was watching. Uh, but it was a high school football team, I think. <clears throat> and uh, the coach took him to a VA hospital. And I know it, said, it sounded like you transported vets around. And uh, they got into the hospital. A lot of guys had one arm, one leg, whatever, a lot of disabilities in the hospital. And uh, one guy's on a treadmill, and he had two stilts, or I don't know what you call artificial legs, but he had the running stilt, whatever, handicapped, and he had no legs. But he could run. And he was on a treadmill running along pretty good. And he looked at the coach and said, who's your best runner? Who, who can, you know, who wants to take me on on the treadmill next to me? Well, this one kid stepped up and said, well, I can do it. Or, you, know, you know, they're kind of like making jests that I can beat this guy. He's on stilts. And he said, let's run till we drop. Whoa. And, and all the other players that kind of gather around, well, what do you, you know, this is kind of odd. And anyway, <clears throat> he did. And guess who won? The veteran. That's right. And the coach talked about heart, talked about dis being disabled and what these guys went through. And it was a really powerful message, and it always sticks with me. And I think it meant a lot to the team and the kids that were there on the football team. I don't remember the exact clip. But that that's kind of neat that you guys can set something aside and – and help veterans that uh, need the help, and I think they'd enjoy the camp. Because, let alone, what a beautiful place it is. Yes, and we let we, alone we dedicate. We have a memorial park area where we have the six flags, which would be include the space yeah. force. We have a, a little bronze statue of one of our campers in a wheelchair, saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh. We have a dedication to uh, those that sacrificed for COVID, and just a, a beautiful. It's amazing the number of people that will drive by park and just go over there it's just yeah. kind of a nice sacred place that we pay play tribute and there's huge stone pillars for each branch of the service it's, it's amazing a gorgeous, gorgeous before i started that try up there i i was stood there and the flags and you're in that kind of that it's 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 it, it's it's worth just to go see that yes. up at camp courageous yeah. so let's talk a little more about uh let's talk about i think you've mentioned the facilities and i don't think you've mentioned what do you call it uh uh Gathering place, the auditorium. What do you what do you call your new facility? Tell us about that. The pond, the zip line, all the things you got going on. If people aren't aware. Once again, I keep going back to no brains. <laughs> things just happen. So, and the worst thing you can tell me <laughs> is that's impossible. You can't do that. Yeah. So, yeah. we were transporting our campers over to Central Park, which is a beautiful lake in Jones County. Yeah. Pretty quiet. Just we had the tryout there once. Yeah, it was and beautiful. And. Um, it reminds me of a story. We'll get there later as you go through this. Good. Yeah, gorgeous <laughs> area. But I always thought anytime you put campers and staff on the roads, there's always a chance something's going to happen. And yeah. we got a half an hour getting the campers loaded, half an hour getting them off. And, you know, it just takes away so long. We need a – We need a. if I was talking to Minnesota, we would not call it a lake, but we call it Lake Todd. It's the pond. So <laughs> <laughs> we understand it's a pond. But uh, so we built this. And our, our, our friends down at Stutzman's, they went out to Montana and obtained a bunch of betonite. So we dug this hmm. out, put
put a bunch of bentonite there and, uh, and started building this. And uh, Jerry Rohr, one of our volunteers, came to me and goes, Charlie, I just saw the coolest thing. I go, what's that, Jerry? He goes, down at the, way down there where the dam is, there's a natural spring. I'm going, no, that's probably not that natural spring. The pond is probably leaking. So, and that was the case. And so we contacted Dave Schmidt Construction out of Cedar Rapids, and we said, okay, we got this problem. And so there's a guy by the name of Jerry Pasco. Jerry has, he has a bunker that used to belong to AT&T, halfway between Cascade and Monticello. And he wanted to dig out an area because he wanted to use nature to cool that bunker. So he wanted to dig this area out, kind of do the geothermal type situation. And, uh, and so Jerry goes, I'll make you a deal. You dig me out the pond, and I'll give you all the clay. So that's exactly what hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of loads of clay went yeah. from that place. And he calls it the uh, Becker Schmidt Pond because it was Dave Schmidt Construction, Charlie Becker from camp. And so we put the clay down there. It's worked out perfect. Right. It's just worked out ideal. So I had put out a note in our newsletters that anybody's interested in helping us build this lake, $100,000 naming rights. So one of our campers by the name of Todd Penaluna, his parents, Todd passed away, and his parents came along and said, we, we'd like to do this in memory of Todd. And so it's called Lake Todd. A week later, I get a phone call from a Mr. Durgan, and he lives in Clinton. He goes, Charlie, I see your newsletter. You need naming rights for, uh, for a pond. He goes, I'm interested in giving the $100,000 for a new pond. And if we only had to do it once, the 100000 would have been great. We would have been wonderful. When you do it twice, we kind of went in the red. So Mr. Durgan, I said, we really appreciate this. And I explained where a camper parent had, uh, had gone for naming rights. But, you know, I'm thinking as quickly as I think, which is kind of slow, I'm going, I can't leave $100,000 on the table. I said, a pavilion. We're going to build a pavilion along the pond, Lake Todd. How would you like to be a part of that? He goes, great, I'm all in. And thus, Start. yeah, Durgan was born and beautiful structure if i if we would have been able to do that for our main lodge we would have but it's just you know and i tell people this is the beauty of being there for a long time if i would have been brand new i should have been fired <laughs> just because you're in the building business it's just okay do you want this or you want this or you want this or you want this and it's just it's a gorgeous gorgeous the campers love it you know a few weeks ago we had a big dance over there with the campers and everything hundreds of campers the place was rocking you and look you over got, Lake Todd, you've got a sandy beach there, you've yes. got kayaks. Inside the pavilion, you've got a great kitchen. Downstairs, of course, you've got the bowling alley. So you can lease that? If you can. Corporate. Anytime when any of our facilities are not being used by the campers, it's available okay. for, for rentals. So, uh, Something yeah. to keep in mind. It really is. The fun thing about it is, my opinion is that everybody has an opinion on what a camp is. But until you come out and see Camp Courageous yeah. in real life, you just have no understanding of, of what a facility is. Can't appreciate it. Too. I got a story for you. What, what was the name of the lake? In, the, lake Todd? No, no, no. The other one in the, the Central Park. Central Park. Yeah, yeah. Central Park. <clears throat> so my first triathlon I did was Camp Courageous. That was, I think, I don't know what year, 10, 2010, I think. I don't remember that far. That'd back. be about but right. Anyway, <clears throat> and they carted us over there in a bus, and then we swam there. And I always remember. The sto- we, you know, I think it was only four or five hundred yard swim, but I remember one of the campers swam. He got out there right in the water. A couple of ladies were with him, and he swam that whole thing. He did a great job and got out. And we we kept going. People were just getting in the water, and I remember seeing him. And then I remember when we finished, some somebody in, that did the try gave him that little Camp Courageous medal. He was the happiest kid on earth. I mean, he was running around showing everybody his medal. He was so proud. That he, you know, he got a medal and so proud that he did the swim. And I'll never forget that, how how that touch that, that somebody else did that did a try gave him his medal. And I'll never forget that at that at that park. And Chris continues to come back with a try. Wonderful it, young man. He's from Washington, Iowa. Yeah. And yeah, just a yeah, that's great a cool young man. So so uh, we got the pavilion. It's a it's got beautiful fir trees. You haven't been around there yet. I First time I was we in Colorado. Yeah. I mean, it almost looks like that. You got you know the rocks. What do you call it? Picture rocks or picture down rocks, below. Yes. When you go down below, that's a good run up the hill. Yes. <laughs> uh, tell me about the zip line. How did that? How did that get started? You got like a little softball area, basketball. I mean, there's all kinds of things around there that you put that's in. Good. 
we, we start, we, like I said, we have a major project every year. And let me just go back to one major project because it's a good story. And it's how I look back and how Charlie Becker actually met the Watts Group. So we got a pool, a beautiful indoor pool. It's six lanes, Grotte. therapeutic pool. Yeah. And so we spend a lot of money. We spend, you know, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000 a month on electricity. Mm. And so the very first move that we want to make is we want to switch everything out to LED lighting, and our pool is our biggest area for lighting and everything else. So we got a hold of Siddler's down here, Ren Miller, and uh, we we're going to have him take a look at the pool, take a look at the lights, and see what they could recommend. And so Ren phones me up. He goes, Charlie goes, I, I got to cancel. I got to postpone our meeting. The two owners of our company were just in a car accident. One died, and we, I, I can't be there. I said, Ren, this is not important at all. Just you deal with, with what's going on right there in the company, and we'll talk later. So he comes out later, and he goes, you know, Charlie, we, we thought about this and uh, decided, you know, there's the pool, and the company thought, eh, you know, maybe we'll donate the lights to the pool. He goes, you know, in light of our owner passing away, we've decided to do the whole camp. We're going to switch every light in this camp over to LED lighting. I said, whoa. I said, there's dozens of buildings here. There's probably thousands of lights. He goes, no, no. He goes, take it one step further. We're going to do it in one day. We're going to do it Saturday, like February 17th. It's around 2017 or so. And uh, we're going to do it in one day. <laughs> and that's where the Watts Group came up. And they were part of that massive group of people that changed out every single light at Camp Courageous and got our electric bills way down. Then we ended up putting solar on top of all our buildings, and that pulled it way down to two or $3,000, saving us 100000 a year. Wow. So that's when we uh, kind of first met up. So we have a major project every year. So the zip line. So we had the old wood zip line, and the mm. counselor would push the camper down, and there'd be another counselor down below that would run them back up. And we had somebody actually get hurt. They did what was called the golf swing. So when they pushed off the camper, they stretched their back and hurt their back. Mm. And I said, we, we, get, we, there's, we got, I'm kind of labor oriented where we got to do this so that only one person has any control and it's, it's more mechanical and everything. So some of our staff saw some examples on the internet and a lot of people had traveled to some and we went up to Chestnut. And it's just a big metal pole, two big mm. metal poles, one's 110 feet in the ground and it zips you up there 110 feet up in the air, 700 feet back, and it lets you go, and you zip down. And here, once again, is the beauty of Camp Courageous. So we got a hold of a company called Eilersons. Eilersons, like during the derecho, you know, they're, they have a, a little substation there in Monticello, but they're into putting up big poles. <laughs> so we got a hold of them. We said, hey, we want to put up this zip line. Is there any way that you can help us with this? Because we just don't have the equipment to put up this 110-foot pole and everything. And they said, sure. So there is about eight footings that are about 12 by 12 by 12 mm. with a ton of metal. And I showed it to an engineer. I said, does this look like it's over-engineered? This is way over-engineered. I go, that's what I want to hear. <laughs> and so uh, they did all that work for free. The cement, they had, they're from, uh, mm. from Wisconsin, and they had a whole team of people come down for two weeks to do that project, paid for everything. Wow. I mean, the, just the type of people. And what a fun thing. I'm sure the kids love it. Don't oh, they? there is a big, <laughs> huge... Then we did the multi-purpose field this past uh, year, yeah. and then once again, Oskaloosa and uh, Moscow yeah. came up, and we got this beautiful mini pitch, which is like a little soccer field. They provided almost all that. And then right now we're working on a miniature golf course. Moscow provided 11 of these lights that are unbelievable for the golf course and then for the actual road, so it lights up the road area. And uh, just a, a great team of people. We had talked great. about Muscle earlier, and uh, I can't say enough good things about Iowa Nice. Yeah. It, Joe it Kirkham, Oscar Lewis. Yes, about that? yes. I'm an old Oscar boy, so that name sounds familiar. Yes, Joe. and we went down there and met with their people, and they said, you know, we want to get more involved in Camp Courageous. And great. they definitely came on board great. full blast. So let, let's, uh, let's spend just a, a few minutes on uh, to, to wrap up. Uh, let's talk about now we know about Camp Courageous and all the fun things that go on and all the exciting things and miracles are happening up there, it sounds like. Tell me about volunteering, how to raise money. 
if you, you feel compelled to, how can you give money? Obviously, just call you and write a check, I guess. But t- tell us more about volunteering, fundraisers, the things that you guys are doing. One of the beauties of Camp Courageous is you can feel it. You can be a part of it. You can see it. And so there's a million things people can do to help us out. What's kind of fascinating is our number one fundraiser is a garage sale in Manchester, Iowa. Really? And so we used to, uh, back in 1976, they'd move from somebody's basement, then to a garage. Then anytime there was an open building in Manchester, they would move the Camp Courageous garage sale there. Eventually, some people by the name of Norby's, uh, Connie and Lauren from Dubuque, they had the Norby stores. And so they had a little dairy, old dairy place that was just for storage. And then they were moving to a new location. And I, and Lauren had passed away, and I contacted Connie. I said, Connie, any thoughts on what you're going to do with the old building? That would be a really nice garage sale for us. And uh, the Norbys donated that building for the uh, Manchester garage sale, and that is our number one fundraiser. And what's fascinating about it, it's run by over 100 volunteers. Nobody gets paid. Good people are bringing things in that they no longer need. They're selling them, and all the proceeds go to the camp. And they have a big list of things that Camp Courageous needs, so they're always setting things aside for Camp Courageous, but that's our number one fundraiser. And then we have things like... Uh, cars, you have a car show. We have a big car show, and the car show is going to be coming up here in May. It's uh, uh, Let me make sure I get the date right. It is May 21st. About four or 500 cars. Wow. Uh, there will be all kinds of unique cars this year, and it uh, should be a, a great turnout, and it, it always is a very, very, very popular one. We got an omelet breakfast the last Sunday of uh, the month of April, and uh, going to show off a lot of the new things out at camp. And then we kind of go on into the Sprint Triathlon, which is uh, August 13th. You've participated in that for right. years and years. The fun thing, Hunter Kemper was there last year. Yeah, the, Hunter is a, a triathlete, but he's an Olympian. He's been in, like, many, many triathletes. Yeah. He's an incredible. Just to sit and talk to that guy. I had the opportunity last year. Fascinating. Yeah. Just fascinating person. Then also Abigail the Advocate will be there. Abigail has a disability. And she does triathlons, and so that'll be real fun. Great. And then uh, in August on the uh, 18th, we have the Pineapple Gala, which is another one of our Great. our big events every year. So there's lots of ways to get involved. There's lots of ways to volunteer. There's lots of ways to give, right? Yes. And it's, you know, once again, going back to money, we appreciate donations. It pays the sure. bill, puts the food on the table and stuff like that. But a lot of people donate food, too. Right. But we appreciate that. But, you know, say, for example, you quilt you, you make quilts, and you have a bunch left over. You know, with nearly 10,000 campers that come out to Camp Courageous, I mean, wow. we go through tons of arts and crafts. So if you've got things that you're thinking about throwing away, keep Camp Courageous in mind because everybody takes their arts and crafts project home. Everybody has a little name tag that we make out of wood that they take home with. Maybe it's a camper with the best smile, but we try to send home with the campers, and they all get free Beanie Babies and stuff like that too. So we make camper T-shirt and... We try no, to send as much home with them as we can. No state that. or federal funding. No state or federal funding. It's Apparently. all done on donations. So all it's donations. A, it's it's a wonderful <laughs> tribute, in my opinion, to the people of this area and, and, and all over that they would support a project like this that touches so many lives. So you got the ten thousand campers, but then you have all the family members that right. it touches too. It's right. just a it speaks volumes. For the good people this I area. think you brought a couple of clips. Is there anything you want to show on that or highlight? Or I not? would love to. These are fun ones. So uh, we'll start off talking about fundraisers. So Camp yeah. Courageous celebrated his 50th anniversary last year. And so my son was out in California, and he goes, Dad, he goes, I got a friend out here. She needs some money to uh, do this trail for charity. And uh, what's the chances of – you've always wanted a Volkswagen van. I said, oh, really? Uh, since when? And so, so – She'll sell you this Volkswagen van. So we trailered the Volkswagen van from California California back to Iowa. And is. I get a phone call. And uh, this group of people want to use the van for something. And this is, this is the video. It's a good one. Hey, Kevin, we are lost. Pull over. We're supposed to be in heaven. Uh, this ain't heaven. We're in Iowa. We're gonna be late. Let's just turn around.
Where'd he come from? Hey, KB, is that Johnny Bench? What is Johnny Bench doing in the middle of nowhere? Pick him up. We need all the karma we can get right now. Thanks, you're the first car by. I'm Johnny, I, I play baseball. I'm looking for a place to watch a game. Well, this is your lucky day, Johnny, because we're going to a place just like that. I heard in some places they pay you a lot of money to talk about baseball. And not at Fox. Hey, KB, is that? No. All over. Hey, man. Hall of Fame ain't supposed to walk. Poppy, we're lost. Do you know how to get to the Field of Dreams? Come on, Kevin. You can say Poppy without GPS. Let's go. Johnny Bench, my dog, El Mejor. What's happening? Uh, mm. Yeah! <laughs> got a Camp Courageous, I hear so many great things and I'm just wishing my hello. Hope the end of your summer is great and sending all the best wishes to you out there. Have fun. Go Camp Courageous. You've got to catch it, boys and girls. It's the best. Hey, go Camp Courageous. Great cause. Let's go. We had to raffle this and we uh, raffled it off on December 31st and a uh, neonatal nurse from uh, from Monticello ended up winning it. So we uh, still see the bus around town a lot. So just, you know, a fun fundraiser. So yeah, and just- uh, How'd you get those guys out in this film? Uh, they phoned us up and they just, uh, there was a representative, a, a young person from uh, Center, Center Point and he had heard that we had a van and they just wanted to borrow the van. And so we brought up to the Field of Dreams and they went out on a back road and, and filmed it. Wow. <laughs> what great. fun. That's great. Then we got another uh, little great. video on uh, the zip line. So we, of course, you know, lots of people have fun at the zip line, mm. but uh, this is uh, just a, a great opportunity. It shows you the thrill that a camper, and this particular camper is in a wheelchair, has with it. Yeah. Here we go. Fast. Ready. All right, three, two, two one. one. What do you think? What do you think of it? We had so much fun that we blasted off into the air. So we've been very, very privileged to, uh, to to serve a lot of campers and meet a lot of folks. And like yourself, they've been so, so good to camp. So sure. we appreciate this opportunity to kind of get the word out. Maybe there will be people out there that can use the services of Camp Courageous. So right. this is a, a, a great opportunity. Charlie, this has been fun. And I just want to thank you. And Again, if you've not been to Camp Courageous, go to Camp Courageous. See the facilities. It's amazing. You do amazing work, all your staff, what you do for all the campers, for all of us. It makes us feel better just to be able to help. And uh, don't forget the triathlon this summer, right? That's right. <laughs> well, we'll be there <laughs> cheering you on. <laughs> so that should be a, a great event. And like you said, Hunter Camper's coming in, who's kind of like Mr. Triathlon yes, and, and, yeah. and the Olympics and all kinds of good things that he a does. Wonderful so, person. Right. So again, Camp Courageous, Charlie Becker, thank you. Thank you, Gary, for the opportunity. You bet. <laughs>